I just think right now, women, especially in business, this is the year of women. I just know that. Life begins at 150 grand a year. Life gets better at 250, and life gets real good at 500. Nobody can tell me differently on it. When you start teaching something, I feel like that's when you start to master the actual art of it. You and I, when we publish a book, we can go toe to toe with any of the New York trade publishers, any of the big time authors. We get to compete in that marketplace and then let the market decide whether our stuff is good. People forget sometimes as an entrepreneur, the whole damn point of entrepreneurship is to make money. And now here is The Win with your hostess, serial entrepreneur, marketeer, and chief sexy boss. Heather Havenwood. Our whole world revolves around our smartphones now. You know they say we look at our phones on an average of 150 times a day or more. Look, if you're a small business and want to grow, you need to reach people where they're looking the most. Their smartphones. So text the word START to 72000 now to learn more from our friends at Mobit or go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash Mobit. Again, text the word START to 72000 now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Win with Heather Havenwood. And The Win is all about helping you start your business no matter where you're at in life. Maybe you're 45 and you've had a career for 20 years, or maybe you're just waiting tables. Maybe you're like, I want to do this. So today I have someone on the line that I've known for a long time. I don't even know how long I've known you, Mike. How long have I known you? Uh, you know, probably long seven, eight seven years. Seven years, something like that. So Mike Dillard, everyone, is on the line with us. And Mike has, wow, been around the block, done a ton of stuff. Right now he is the host of Self Made Man Podcast. You can go check him out at MikeDillard.com. But he has a very interesting story, and I'm going to allow him to share it because it is a story that I think every American and every entrepreneur can really relate to. But he started out, as he calls himself, a dead broke guy waiting tables. And within 18 months, he built a business. So, Mike, let's start with that journey. You're hanging out. You're waiting tables in Austin, Texas, where we're both located right now. How did you start? What what happened there? Uh, Sure. Well, I uh, decided that I wanted to become an entrepreneur when I was in college. So by my junior, senior year, uh, I knew that I wanted to own my own business and not work for anybody else. And um, that was around the year 2000, 1999, 2000. So quite a quite a bit of while ago at this point. And, you know, back then, that was web 1.0 days, there was no YouTube, Facebook, MySpace, or, you know, really any of that stuff. So if you wanted to start a business and you're a broke college student, your one of your your best options and most prevalent was the network marketing industry. So Mary Kay, Amway, Avon, Herbalife, that that kind of world. And so that's what I found and dove into that industry. It took me about five or six years of complete failure to ever make an actual, you know, dollar of profit. But I eventually did, probably in two thousand four ish, two thousand five figured out how to build a business and, again, was waiting tables at the time. This was in San Antonio at a, at a P.F. Chang's. Uh, within 18 months, was able to build my first seven-figure business, and that was in 2005, and uh, really haven't looked back since then. Absolutely. I love that. And you know what? The, the thing that I hear with that is that you actually persevered. And the network marketing business, I would say, is one of the most challenging business models, I think, personally. So I, I really acknowledge you for going you know going down that road. But so let's talk about today. You do all kinds of crazy stuff. MyDillard.com, you can check it out. But honestly, I see you out there doing, um, what do you call that? Like racing or something crazy like that? You're, what do you yeah, do? racing. Uh, I do a lot of racing. I, my first race was in 2008. It was yeah. off-road, actually. It was the Baja 1000. So uh, longest, most dangerous race in the world. <laughs> um, somebody dies every year. Nice. But, uh, let's do that for a living. I'm just yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was it was a blast. I, I uh that was my first time, you know, buckled in with a helmet in a race car, decided to, to take on the, the scariest race on the planet. Absolutely loved it. And so I've done off-road racing uh, every year. I, I do the Mint 400 every year uh, with Patrick Dempsey. So we're competing against each other in the same class, and, and that's always been fun. And then uh, two years ago, I, we have the Circuit of the Americas here in Austin, the you know, nicest Formula One track in North America in my backyard. So spent the last year and a half getting my professional racing license. And I'm currently competing in the uh, the Porsche series. You're kidding. I didn't know that about you, actually. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so is this a new, another new event, just a new business? Are you making money from this or just like total fun, loving life, just risk? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's my, it's my escape, but it's, it's also become my biggest passion. So my, my goal from a work perspective is to, you know, create some kind of a, of a, a liquidity event, if you will, in the next three to four years that, that would allow me to race uh, full time professionally. And which is essentially what Patrick does these days. Uh, he's a, a factory driver for Porsche and came in second, I think, in Le Mans two years ago. And uh, I would love to follow in his footsteps. But it is definitely one of the most expensive hobbies on the planet. And there's no money to be made. Um, yeah. So it's, a, uh, you know, you've got a how much are you willing to spend and lose on an annual basis to feed your habit? And so right. uh, that's kind of where I'm it at. It reminds me of uh, Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy talks about how he does race the horse. horses. Yeah, horse yeah. Race. He talks about how expensive it is. He makes zero money at it, but he absolutely loves it. I can really get that. So I'm just curious. Do you find a correlation between entrepreneurship and risking your life on a Formula One track. Is there some like there's a correlation connection there? Yeah, you know, I'd have to say I'd have to say clearly if you're an entrepreneur, you're you've got some kind of comfort level when it comes to risk and in life in general. And the thing that I like about racing is that it's extremely competitive. You know, it's it's kind of like golf, meaning every time you you swing the club, you're always striving for perfection and maybe you'll get it and maybe you won't. And you know, it's the same in racing when it's taking an apex or you know, your line on the track, it is uh, something you could do for 20 years and never, you know, never perfect the process. The part that I enjoy most about it is obviously we're doing that at 100 miles an hour. And so there's a danger element that makes you it, think? well, it just <laughs> makes it real, right? When right. you're in any other sport, the consequence to missing a basket is nothing. The consequence to missing a corner on a racetrack is potentially death. So what you do actually matters. And there's a lot of responsibility that you know, you have to you have to take. And I like that part of it. I like yeah. the fact that it's not just a game, it really is, you know, putting your life in your own hands kind of a situation. Yeah, so I, I can see that you're talking about golf. I'm like, I don't know if there's a correlation there might between golf and risking your life. But I guess I can see that correlation. But I'm just laughing because I don't know yeah. anyone actually yeah. dying on the golf course. Let's get struck <laughs> by lightning, which I think has happened. That's not true. So Today, you're focused a lot on even new venture. You have a podcast, Self Made Man, which, by the way, I absolutely love not only the um, the name of it, but I also know there's a little bit behind there of Anne Ran. Uh, you have a, a huge love for her. At least that's what I've seen online, your social media. And I actually would love to ask you that question about that, about your view. And I remember just seeing some things and maybe just help me out as you talked about Anne Ran and your philosophy on that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, probably five or six years ago, I read Atlas Shrugged, yeah. and it's uh, kind of like the Bible for entrepreneurs. And if you haven't read it, it's it's almost like a rite of passage because it's not the easiest book to read. I think it's close to a thousand pages, eight hundred, you know, nine hundred pages long. And so, just finishing it is uh, is an accomplishment. But the the lessons learned uh, as you're going through it will stick with you forever. And there is a sculpture that has been advertised, uh, a bronze sculpture piece that's been advertised in the pages of Rob Report for 15 years now. I think it's one of the longest running ads in history. But it's for this giant sculpture of a gentleman carving, carving himself out of a block of stone. And it's called The Self-Made Man. It's by a, a female artist out of uh, Colorado. And it's just the perfect name with the perfect visual representation for that. And so that became uh, one of the original kind of pieces of art or logos for The Self-Made Man podcast. Yeah, so that's really the inspiration behind that and, and where that came from. You know, Self-Made Man is interesting. I've spent the last year, year and a half acquiring all of the IP for that. So I do actually own the trademark for Self-Made Man now, uh, along with the domain. And I would have loved to have gotten Self-Made and, and have it be a bit more inclusive. But uh, that is okay. unfortunately owned by someone else who has no interest in, in selling it. And so mm -hmm. Self-Made Man it was. Yeah, so that's been a hugely rewarding project. We think we're up to 75 episodes now, so about a, about a year and a half or 16, 16 months or so into the show. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun ride and, and very rewarding for not only myself, but uh, you know, for the audience as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a listener of it. And I do actually love, I didn't know the background of the art that you just shared that. I didn't know it was by mm -hmm. email. Um, that was interesting, Colorado. And I, I actually really love that piece. It makes sense to me. And I, I just had the word fee in front of mail. 
Um, but I do really love that piece because I think you're right. It's kind of a rite of passage in, in entrepreneurship. And I actually just read that book two years ago. So it's recent, mm. you know, because it's one of those, like when you see it, you're like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> that's like a Bible. Yeah. And it's a ton. But there's the life lessons in that book is pretty extraordinary. Pretty impressed with that. And I, I feel like you're one of those people that actually live and you've read it, but you breathe it. Like you actually own it and you live you live that world every single day as an entrepreneur. And I'm going to read your mission that I just grabbed from your website on MalikDeller.com. And so my mission, my purpose is to empower those who want to change their life and change the world for the better with the knowledge and skills they need to do so. So that's pretty awesome. Tell us about that mission and where is that going? What are you doing now to fulfill that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That was uh, kind of, you know, distilled down during Tony Robbins' five-day-long date with destiny, which I attended in 2000, fall of 2014. It was actually, I was actually at the event that was filmed for oh, the I I'm Not that. Your Guru. Yeah, so I'm in the audience in, in that film. And you know, part of it is coming up with with your mission, and that uh, through that process, uh, an event is what I I you know came up with uh, for mine, and it seems to be quite fitting. Even after you know ten years as an entrepreneur, I think that encapsulates what I've spent the last ten years doing. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to the Win with Heather Havenwood. Are you over forty five, sixty? Are you relying on the traditional medical field to help you feel great and get you back to a balanced body? Good luck with that. At e2lab.com, Dr. Don Salio got sick of people complaining about bloating, inflammation, and feeling sluggish. He has created unique, potent, and powerful non-pharmaceutical supplements to help the body rebalance, detox, and get back to being healthy. Go to e2lab.com, getting you back to healthy and balanced. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. I've just realized that I have a knack for for teaching and for taking complex things and and making them easy to understand and and communicating and writing, and so I think that that mission kind of really, really fits me quite well. Do you find that there's a couple of things here? One, in my experience, and I think you you just said it perfectly, that a lot of entrepreneurs find their mission and purpose after they've had some what I call successes or failures. Like they find it later. I know for myself, I think if you asked me back in 2001, what's your mission purpose? I'm like, I don't want to make money, like survive tomorrow. I'm not. Sure. Yeah, for sure. You, I think you absolutely go through phases. Yeah. In the beginning, everybody just wants to make money because you want to quit your job. And that is where I, you know, was. And I think that's where everybody has to start and where you'll continue to, to focus on until you actually do make money. And then you can sit back and, and by that time, you know, you've probably been at it five, six, seven, eight years. You've acquired some skill sets. You've learned about yourself, and and at that point, I think you're finally in a position where you can step back, look at who you've become, and and really figure out, okay, now how can I apply, you know, my skill set to the world in the biggest way that I that I can. And at that point, you can you know really formulate a mission for yourself. But I don't know if you could do it beforehand. No, you're right. I know for myself, like I said, 2001. If you asked me, like I don't know, make money, yeah, <laughs> quit sure. My job. And do you find Two questions. One, do you consider yourself a teacher or a coach or either one or both or neither? And do you find teaching rewarding at this point in, in your business and career? Yeah, I mean, I can't think of really, you know, a better word than that. So I'd say that's an appropriate label. You know, the rewarding part is really interesting. It's, uh, it's unbelievably rewarding when you hear from people that have been positively impacted by your work. They send you a testimonial, you know, whatever it may be, say thank you. That's one of the most rewarding things you can ever experience. At the same time, it's unbelievably frustrating when you are a teacher at scale, if you will, meaning you're online and your work is being seen by, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people. And you wake up to a daily basis, you know, comments on Facebook or whatever it may be of, you know, this is a scam or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it's it just, uh, you feel bad for humanity sometimes. But, um, that can be uh that can be draining and it's unfortunate and it's very sad. I don't know if I've ever gotten used to that after 10 years. So yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I was going to ask you, I know that you've gone through a, diff a few different phases in your businesses. You're now, would you say like your third, like I call it mm -hmm. from my perspective, looking from the outside, looking in right into the fishbowl. It looks like your third big business right now, like in your third phase. Yeah. 
you know, how do you deal with that negativity? Because I know, I mean, let's just be honest here. I went through massive bankruptcy. I'm not saying you did, but I know you went through some massive turmoil with your past business and it was kind of public. You know what I mean? I don't want to know the details because I have like the rumors of stuff, but I never really like, well, I'm going to go figure out what Mike's doing. And, you know, I just really, from my view, I mean, we lived near each other. I was like, well, I hope he, he does well and he's always going to come back. And I just always knew you were going to come back. And you're, you're not like back. You're like, I think, uh, way better off than even you were, I think, just looking at you from a fishbowl, you know? Yeah. 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 So it, it's, you um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the saying or the quote is you're, you're not a real entrepreneur until you've made it, lost it and made it back again. So, Check mark. Check mark. um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm on the third chapter in the third phase of that. And, but there's a so, difference between falling and falling really publicly. And I think that's what I'm talking about. You've, I'm not saying you failed, but you've had this kind of business that just whatever happened, the circumstances, it publicly failed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so, I, yeah, I, well, to give people, to give people the context. five minute, the five minute overview, right. uh, you know, in 2000, 2010, 2011, we, uh, you know, we started kind of a financial education company and I was essentially sharing my lessons learned when it came to, to finance and investing, which was a topic that I was super interested in uh, at that period in my life. And uh, it was a phenomenally successful business. We had 50,000 members uh, all over the world. We were doing about a million dollars a month in revenue. And uh, it was essentially, you know, like almost like a video podcast where we were just doing video lessons and interviews of, of individuals who were, you know, experts or, you know, when it came to finance and investing on different topics. And uh, unfortunately, about a year and a half into it, one of the guys we, we interviewed turned out uh, he was a con man. And uh, the moment that that came to light, uh, you know, all of the trolls came out from under the under the bridges with their pitchforks and tried to, you know, associate me with with what took place or blame me for what took place or whatever it may be. And so going through that publicly, yeah, it was it was yeah. horrific. You know, lost my marriage from the stress. My business partner got leukemia. The business, uh, you know, went from a million dollars a month to to 100, 150, uh, which was, you know, enough to barely cover employee yeah. salaries. and. Yeah, waking up to, you know, you being the subject of troll blogs and posts was mm-hmm. uh, was super difficult. But I got some really good advice from a mentor of mine. And he said, all you can do is be completely transparent and honest and open about what's taking place. And that's it. And as long as you're honest about what's happening, then the truth will come out and, and you have an opportunity to even heighten your audience's trust with you or strengthen it because they'll know that no matter what happens, Mike will always tell the truth. And so that was really, you know, what I did, you know, as far as our involvement in the matter, it was very clear to, to the government, and the agencies that, you know, eventually took over the case that we had nothing to do with it. So our business was never even put on pause for a single day. We, you know, we continued operations as normal and and it was a long two year, very expensive legal process where I was the key witness in the whole thing. And uh, as of last year, the bad guys were found guilty and, you know, will hopefully be going to jail soon. So nonetheless, it was two to three years of absolute hell. And, you know, it, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was about as bad as it gets. But, yeah, um, you know, but yeah. honestly, and, I, and I'm really sorry you went through that. And I, I really am. And I, I think, though, my question to you is, what did you learn out of that? Because what I see on my side is in, in just as for, just from, you know, social media and things like that, if you've not only come back, but you really have come back completely new. And I think way more authentically and people just love and adore you. I mean, I think people are just really attracted to that. And your mission is really to empower people. And I, I love that. But really, what did you looking back? What did you learn from that whole process? Yeah, a couple of things. You know, the first one is you have to approach business in a in a much more mature manner. You know, in this industry, it's very interesting where it's very collaborative, yeah. and it's filled with people who do not have a lot of experience in the business world or or as entrepreneurs. Many, you know, ninety nine percent of us are all self made and self taught, and there's a lot of naivete when it comes to you know agreements, contracts, vetting people things like that, where I think, at least speaking for myself, I have a tendency to trust someone until they give me a reason not to. 
And that is a great way to go about life in many ways, but that does create the opportunity for things to bite you in the ass, which is what happened. And so, you know, there's the, there's the maturity lesson that was received as far as that goes. But the other one was, you know, readjusting my priorities and perspective on what's really important in life where, you know, as before it was, uh, let's continue to try and build the biggest business that I can possibly build. And then after it, it was, uh, you know, shifted quite a bit to where it, it really is described as, to, you know, as long as somebody I love is not in front of me bleeding and dying, everything is fine. Like, doesn't matter how much money's in the bank, doesn't matter what kind of car you're driving. It's like, as long as you're alive, and everybody you care about is doing well, then all of the boxes are checked. You know, that's kind of my new perspective now. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Are you a business owner that has a website but not tech savvy? Do you feel like a hostage to your web guy? The better question is, do you have a money funnel so people come to your page and give you money while you sleep? No? Then go watch free video at heathermakesyoumoney.com. Imagine having a money site, not a website, for your self-published book, e-commerce products, local practitioners like chiropractors or lawyers. Get a money site, not a website. Go watch free video at heathermakesyoumoney.com. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. I remember when I went through my bankruptcy, someone said to me in the middle of it, like, you're going to share this one day. And I was like, hell no, I'm not going to share this. You know, <laughs> I was like, this is going to be yeah. like trying to keep this underground as much as I possibly can. And of course, a few people knew at the time just because it was a little bit of public, but not, not as big as yours. And I think that people are so quick to uh, shoot the gun at people versus really realizing what it really takes to be a public figure at any level, right? Either um, as an actor or as, you know, online marketer, whatever that looks like. It takes a lot to put yourself out there um, and to be really transparent because we are in a business where it's very collaborative and we are in a business that sometimes people who really aren't real <laughs> and they take things from you and stuff like that. So I, I could really appreciate you sharing that story. And you really have completely come back so what are you doing now? Other than the podcast, what are you doing now? Like, what, what, what are you doing? Yeah, sure. So, future, future, future. you know, two years ago, I had, uh, I, I left that business. I gave it to my business partner, Robert. And I just, I literally just walked away. And, and you know, it was like being married to a girl who was constantly cheating on you on a daily basis and, and right. causing you unbelievable amounts of grief and pain. And it's just like, I don't want to be involved in this anymore. So, you know, I walked away and, and at that point I had literally nothing. Like I didn't have any any courses or products. Everything I, I had done was still a part of that business. And so I had to really figure out, well, what the hell do I want to do with my life? And if I have an opportunity to start over, it, you know, for me, we are all going to work 12 hours a day. You might as well apply that to the biggest potential win that you could create for yourself rather than not. It's the same amount of work either way. And I've always built businesses around my passion, and I've had two passions at the time. I had, uh, I had a passion around, obviously, self-improvement and education for men, specifically young men, and the impact that they can, they can provide to their romantic relationships, their, their roles as parents, uh, their roles as, as leaders in society, and uh, you know, really having a, a positive impact uh, was an interest of mine. And the second one was food. You know, I have a, a six-year-old. And so we've tried our best to raise him on organic produce and, and all of that stuff. And I live literally 100 yards away from Whole Foods here in, in Austin. And so eating clean is a super big passion of mine. But it is very apparent that unless you're doing quite well in society, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'd say 95% of Americans, uh, you know, don't have the ability to financially go spend $100, $200 a week on organic produce. Uh, you're literally forced to eat poison. And I thought that that's absolutely ridiculous. And so, you know, being inspired by Peter Diamandis and his book Abundance, and how he talks about the decentralization of all of these huge industries that we've seen over the last 15 years, whether that's Uber or Airbnb or 99 Designs or whatever it may be, all of the biggest industries are becoming decentralized. And I was like, why hasn't anyone decentralized farming yet? Every single person on the planet needs to eat. Uh, and yet there's been literally no innovation 
uh, in that industry outside of, you know, tractors that drive themselves with GPS is probably the biggest one in the last couple of decades. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, why can't we decentralize the organic farm and put a little farm in everybody's kitchen that's totally automated and runs itself that would, you know, get rid of all of the pesticides and chemicals and really eliminate the entire supply chain? Because if you eliminate the farm, the tractor, the insurance, the 18 wheelers, the, the distribution and boxing and the retail store, you get rid of 90% of the cost. And so that's, you know, really something that I got passionate about and decided that that was going to be my primary focus. So I partnered with a company in Silicon Valley called Whipsaw that is in a, a really kind of a high tech industrial design firm. And we started developing that product about a year and a half ago. So I've got the prototype sitting a few feet away here in my living room now. Oh, and cool. um, Is there a name for it? Is there a name for this prototype? Can't can't mention can't yet. Still it. in okay. the yeah, <laughs> still uh, still in the works there. But um, you know, it absolutely works. And the bottom line is that we have a device that'll grow about four grand a year in organic food in your house uh, wow. for about four hundred bucks. So that's the the big goal. What I'm mm-hmm. what I'm realizing though. It's my first physical product I've ever developed, and I definitely bit off a huge piece here. Is that it is going to end up costing, you know, probably two to three million dollars just to get it to a point where it's ready for manufacturing. And so I've had to figure out a way to fund that. And so Self Made Man uh, was started in parallel, if you will, at the same time with the the intention of, you know, continuing to. Uh, create products on different topics that I can provide value on, uh, marketing those and and selling those through the self-made man brand uh, has really been the fuel that has funded the development of the hydroponic system. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the goal and the mission. And so you're it. creating a hydroponic. Is that is that would that we call? Yep. What would you call this thing? Hydroponic. Uh, I just thing? call it an automated hydroponic. You know, automatic system. hydroponic. Wow. That's pretty impressive there, Dillard. <laughs> pretty yeah. Impressed. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've got some absolutely amazing people on the board that are involved yeah. in it. And I, I, I'm kind of holding that under my, my coat as well until the time is right. But what I found is that either through self-made or through the hydro product, if you have a mission that people can really get behind, they will. And so both of those businesses have really been critical to my comeback, if you will, because they're, they're things that people understand and they appreciate and they can support it and get behind it. And they're happy to be involved or participate. And so, you know, that's been a really, really, really big piece to, to the last year or two. You know, it, it reminds me of Maslow's hierarchy. <laughs> The mm. little triangle. And um, it feels like, it sounds like to me, you're really on that top part, that enlightenment. You know, you're really on that a different kind of level where you're focused on how can I really give back um, on a way bigger scale to society, world, you know, globally? Um, how can I make a true difference? Um, and so the money you're creating is to fund that enlightened piece, right? That's what I see like the higher. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so it's been a, it's been the biggest challenge I've ever I've ever undertaken. It's definitely uh, you know kind of an all or nothing type scenario where uh, you know every penny I've I I own is is in that and continues yeah. to fund that. So uh, I'm confident that it will go well. But if for some reason it didn't, you know I'd I'd be back to square one again and starting over. So um, oh, I'm sure we'll see you at the UN one day. Talk to uh, you. Uh, you never know. I, I really yeah, not a, that. not a, not a, <laughs> not only yeah, only if I have an opportunity to to bring it to an end. I'm not a fan of the UN, but <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's true. If, I, if you're speaking from an a- Ayn Rand Atlas Shrugged yes, perspective, yes, that's true. That's very true. Well, what are they? What is it? Is it politicians are specifically re- referred to as moochers? I believe in the book. Yes, they are. Yeah. Which they are. However, they yeah. can be leveraged and used for use needed. <laughs> bot, bot, <laughs> <laughs> bot, aka. <laughs> right. Or create a foundation, Dillard, and then you can really expand. Just kidding. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what the future will bring. Just don't create a Dillard foundation right now. You know what I mean? They're going to yeah. be weird. Not after this. Um, I'm kidding. I'm totally playing on anti-Clinton. 
So thank you for this. This has been a very interesting conversation with you. And, um, you know, I've been poking at you for a couple of months now to be on my show. So I really appreciate it. And there was a reason why I wanted you on my show is that we're in the same circles, but I don't, like, I don't, we don't hang out or anything. There's a lot of ton of people that we, we cross circles a lot and things like that. And sometimes I see you at Whole Foods like, hey, could live down the street. But I just, you know, I've always admired you from far. And I remember when everything was kind of what I call blowing up. And I just remember going, you know, you guys don't really know what's going on. Like, you just can't, you can't judge that because I've been there. I've been, now mine was a business partner. It's a little different, the circumstances, but it was still paperwork and lawyers and all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, one day something happened, boom, your whole life changes within 24 hours. And so I can really relate to yeah. um, a lot of the, the motions that you went through and situational. And so I, I always, you know, just acknowledge you from afar and like, you know, hopefully he'll move through this and flip onto the other side, which you have. Which yeah. Really yeah. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. It's uh, it's a cool community we have here in Austin. And for those who are listening, if uh, you feel inspired to, you know, pull your roots up and relocate, this would be the place to come. <laughs> Now you're see you're being nice. I'm the person that keeps telling people don't move here, go to Dallas. Uh, it's uh, way uh. too busy. It's way we're way too crowded. But if you're here for the internet marketing party, yeah, definitely come out. We yeah. have a really cool crowd here. And definitely. it's been actually been a big piece. So thank you, Mike, for being here. Any last words or places that you want to have people check you out other than MikeDillard.com? No, thanks. Thanks for having me, Heather. Much appreciated. And um no, that's really, that's kind of where everything is at right now. So everything I'm doing is on there. And uh, if you want to kind of keep up to date on the the hydroponics thing, just get on my my email newsletter. And uh, whenever the time comes that we're ready to to go public with that, you know, the, those individuals will be the first to know. So awesome. that's pretty much it. Awesome. That's actually, I'm, I'm on your list. So yay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. And you can check out Mike at MikeDillo.com. This is The Win with Heather Havenwood. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Have you ever wanted to stop swapping your time for money? Ever wanted to leverage your expertise by selling your knowledge to hundreds of people? I call that smart. And now you can easily and effortlessly, without a web guy, create memberships, online courses, coaching programs. Go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash thinkific. Start making money off what you know today. Go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash thinkific. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Welcome to another edition of Heather Highlights. Here at The Win, I get to ask the experts about themselves, their stories, their views. And in this Heather Highlight, I am interviewed and probed about my story, successes and failures. So enjoy. Today, I'm interviewing Heather Ann Havenwood. She's been named top 50 must-follow women entrepreneurs for 2017 by Huffington Post. So tell us a little bit about what you do right now and, you know, as a serial entrepreneur, but, you know, how you are operating right now in your business world. Yeah, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So what does that mean, right? So I have a couple businesses that I run. I have a weight loss company here in Austin, Texas, as well as a supplement company online. Um, I have my coaching business where I teach people mainly how to take their business and sales to the next level. But mainly my focus is information marketing. Well, what is that, right? So how do you take your knowledge that you maybe have learned from your degree or maybe you've learned from 10, 15 years or 20 years on the job? How do you take that and leverage that in what I call sell that in the world. That's been what I call my um, secret sauce since 2001 is information marketing. How do you basically take your information and leverage it with one, two or 10 or 20 or hundred people? So that's really what I do now. Got it. Well, I know that you've been called the quote wizard behind the yes. curtain. So <laughs> what's that? So what that means is what's happened over the years since 2001 is I was behind the scenes where I would have people come to me and say, Hey, I'm really good at back in the day it was real estate. So I know how to buy and sell houses. I know how to teach people how to do stock market. And so I would say, great, well, we need to create a course around now. So I was the one behind the scenes helping develop the course, helping develop the seminar, like the teaching three or four day seminar, helping develop the masterminds, all those pieces now that we you know hear so much about coaching, masterminds, seminars, coaching programs, uh, events. That's what I used to do for other people, right? Behind the scenes, 
So I built a business in, in 2005 with one of my business partners from zero to a million dollars in one year. And he came to me and he's like, hey, you know, I'm a lawyer by day, but, you know, during the weekend and whatnot, I've been like buying and selling houses for like 10 years. I'm really good at it. I want to teach other people how to do that. How do I help other people do that? Like, how do I get in that world? Because what's interesting is that whatever world you're in, right, what it could be anything, real estate investing to um, how to sew, or how to knit, whatever, there's a different world when you take it into now I'm going to teach people how to do the thing I do, right? There's like, a, there's the education piece. And that's what I help people do. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, so talk a little bit about I know that one of the things that we find, I think, just as people, as regular humans, is to yeah. see someone achieve great success and go, wow. And then, I mean, your story is one that's a personal one where you achieved great success, then some other things happened that weren't so great, and then you achieved success again. Talk about how, talk about what that was that happened and how you navigated through this sort of volatile volatility in your life. You know, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think my story starts a little bit like most a lot of people. Um, I started in corporate America back in the day as one of my 20s. And I was told at a young age that, you know, you go, you go get your degree and then you work for a company and you make them money and they give you part of that and you're happy. Like, that's just, you know, like how I thought life was. And so um, I did very well. I worked for SBC Global in my 20s, early 20s in, in North Texas. And I became number one in the country at 10,000 reps. And after, uh, after being there for four years, which was business to business outside sales. And that was like, you're a senior you know, after four years <laughs> yeah. in that business. And I was one of the only, I was the only female, actually. Um, I was the only female in the particular business to business. My, the females that were in the, they were in the office were like customer service or support. Right. So here I am 25 years old. And then, um, I get my pat on the head. Congratulations. You're number one in the country. And then I, um, I get fired and it really threw me, right? It really threw me for a loop because I thought, huh, I thought that's like what you're supposed to do. So it threw me into, it started my journey entrepreneurship. Like all I knew is I didn't want that. And so I actually started into the entrepreneurship world and I uh, bumped along, along the way. And then back in 2005 and six, I started, a, um, I had a, again, a client come to me and say, Hey, let's build this business, this information marketing business. I had been and consulting in for so many years. I said, great, let's do it. So we went from zero to a million dollars in one year and things were great, right? And then, um, then you know, one of these things, like then I came home one day and then everything was gone. I <laughs> came back to the office one day, everything was gone. Birch accounts were closed and bank accounts were emptied and like everything's gone, like overnight. And it threw me into massive bankruptcy and foreclosure. This is right in the start of 2007, right? So when the market, if you remember back in the day, this market was falling um, and uh, lost my house and lost everything, lived out of my car with my dog and cell phone for a couple of years on people's couches. That was really the turning point for me of you know, what is this all about? What, what are we, what are we doing here? Should I just go get a job? What, what's the point of entrepreneurship? Like, this is, you know, this is crazy. I'm smarter than this. There was a lot of stuff going on in my head and I had to really kind of go deep um, into myself and soul and figure out, you know, what is the purpose of business and entrepreneurship? Is it just to make money and always to have a life or, you know, what is that? So uh, that's when I wrote my book, Sexy Boss, and I call it my journey from bankruptcy to sexy boss. And it was kind of a story of me uh, tapping into who I really am and what I'm really good at and how, um, how I build a business about help about helping people. And so now it's interesting. The number one thing I learned from that particular massive, you know, catastrophe is, is this, here's the lesson. I never gave myself permission to fail ever. And mm -hmm. That was the moment. My friend of mine who I'm like, I was in tears. It was like a year into it, right? I'm still dealing with the, the legalities. And my friend's like, here, write this, write this down. And I'm like writing down and through my tears. He's like, I, Heather, give myself full permission to fail. And I could barely write it. And I realized in that moment, you know, ever since kindergarten, right? Don't, don't fail. You can't go with your friend to first, the you know, first grade. Don't, don't fail second grade. Can't go to third grade. On and on it goes. And then in business, it's like, go fail, <laughs> go try something and see if it works. Right. And so it gets what we think, right? Right. Completely against what we think. And so here I am, massive failures in my face. And that's when I realized, and he said to me, Heather, there's no way you're going to succeed again, unless you give yourself full permission to fail. 
And that was a Heather highlight for the entire interview. Check out the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Interested in coaching with Heather? Go to heatherhavenwood.com and sign up for a business discovery consultation. Here is your free gift for listening. Get three audio chapters of Heather's book, Sexy Boss, How Women Empowerment is Changing the Rulebook, when you text the word sexy to 7200. Again, text the word sexy, that is S-E-X-Y, to 7200 and receive your three audiobook chapters. Number is good only in North America. This is a sexy boss rap. This podcast is a copyright of Havenwood Worldwide, LLC.